Here's part one of our conversation with the great Rick Emmett. I think this is my eighth or ninth interview with Rick through the years. In this one, we tackle, well, it's the pink elephant question. I just recently asked his bass player and also sometime producer of Triumph, Mike Levine, the same question. But will there ever be a Triumph reunion? Part one with Rick Emmett. And remember, if you want to see the whole interview, it's on our Rock History Book page right now. Links in the description. Here's Rick Emmett. So I asked Mike this and I said, you know, uh, I always have to ask the reunion questions because they'll, they'll, they'll eat me alive if I don't. I can't believe you didn't notice that. You know, it's, and I, 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 I said, I was telling him, uh, he, he, I think he said, oh, the pink elephant question. Yeah, you got to ask it. But right. when I asked him about a reunion and I, I, I was not, expe- I, I expected what he said. He said, well, you know, just to get out there and to do even a Zeppelin one-off thing, uh, takes so much time and practice. Uh, again, our just task, right? To, to, to get out there and do it. And then not even mentioning a tour or stuff, but what, what's your take on that? Is that's, that's not going to happen, is it? No. And there's, uh, there's just so many stumbling blocks for the first of the, the, uh, the, the, the biggest of them all is that it's for Gil, like to be a drummer that has to sing in a, in a rock band, like, like we had, um, it, that would take him, I would say, six to eight, eight weeks of like a physical kind of training to get himself into shape. Just to, like even for the uh, when we did the thing for the uh, documentary, like he and I rehearsed for, I would say, I don't know, two and a half weeks, you know, just so that he could kind of get himself into just to the shape of and uh, and nobody's any younger. You know, so, I mean, I can't hit the high notes of those songs anymore. So, you know, we'd already started a, a life where guitars were being detuned, uh, you know, songs were being transposed, you know, everything's getting lower and lower and lower until there's very little of Rick left in the screen. Rick, you know, where'd you go? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, I'm not really in there anymore. And you could do it where you could say, okay, yeah, but well, we'll just, we'll have, you know, backing tracks and we'll have, you know, or, and we'll get, we'll be like, you know, Steely Dan would have the three girls, you know, uh, doing backgrounds or Pink Floyd. Like there, there's ways you could you can get around. Clapton would do that. He'd have background singers and and you can and you can pad it up. You could have a guy on keyboards behind a scrim, you know, the Wizard of Oz. But then now you're sort of defeating the whole integrity of it in the first place, you know, like. Um, but that's not to say that some bands don't do it. They go, no, no, we figured out this way around integrity. We're good. To, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to get to play all of the uh all of the uh, casinos, <laughs> you know, we can do a casino tour and have this kind of a presentation. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, I can't buy into that, you know. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, you know, what does sort of suit me, that writing a book of poetry and then doing a bunch of Zoom interviews, like this suits me. I am really happy you know, in this life that I kind of have now, where, you know, I get to see my grandkids on the weekends and, and, you know, like, uh, I I like my life. I really, I'm enjoying this chapter of my life, maybe even more than I enjoyed any other chapter, because I kind of, I think I figured out this thing of being in this moment, you know, and when you think about going on tours, there's so much, as Mike said, there's so much that's about well, you got to plan for all the, you, you got to have all of these contingency plans for all of these things. And, you know, there's agents and there's travel agents and there's roadies and there's tr- trucks and buses. And, and you go, yeah, that's just way too much work. You know, let me just get my pencil and my yeah, book yeah. and I'll, uh, I'll go to work. I can hear you fine. Can you hear me all right? You don't Do have enough little... guitars. That I'm, I'm starting to get worried about you. I don't, I don't wait. Oh. <laughs> Oh look! Uh, so it's it's not a picture; it's real. People oh. say, "What are you doing?" I go, "That's my vanity right there." That's you know when I interviewed Glenn Shorick, the lead singer of LRB, he had his gold albums in the back, right? And I didn't, re- and you probably know about this. Yeah, well, they're there. Yeah, but he yeah. said there's a stigma for some artists. They go, "Oh, look, he put his gold albums." And I I said, "Oh my God." Oh my God, I don't have one award to my name. If I had one, it'd be right there. Well, uh, in truth, they, they don't matter as much to me as some people might think. 
Uh, but uh, when we downsized and we moved uh, from the house that we raised our kids in, I gave all the kids guitars and gold records and said, you know, build a shrine for your old pop, you know, somewhere in the basement of your house or in a rec room or something. Because I just had so much, you know, and I hate to say it, but I had so much <laughs> that I, you know, I had to kind of downsize. Um, but uh, at the, once COVID hit, it, I, I was, I used to be in the basement. My studio was in the basement and um, my wife decided that was going to become a family room where the, where, when the grandkids came over, they could watch movies and hang around. And so that had to get upgraded and get a nice gas fireplace. So the basement where I used to be a troll was no longer available to me. So I moved to this upstairs uh, kind of back bedroom, which is, is slated for uh, redevelopment too. The wall's going to get knocked out and it's going to become a bigger music room studio. But uh, and it took me about two weeks to, to, to order the that wood slat thing with that they hang from from the states because you can't get them in Canada and, and then get all the guitars you know hung up. So I put the, the gold records in behind them because it was like I can it's like one fell one swell foop. I can I can get rid of all the stuff in one place and it's all done. And they're actually up and out of the way like I'll show you this too. they're, they're all racked underneath too. Oh my God. So like there, you know, there's like Les Pauls and Tellies and, that I've had over the years, but this is it. That's the actual collection. And so it's not a bad thing to sort of sit in front of and go, okay, this is my vanity. This, I this ask everyone, my... I ask everyone, everyone I talk to now, do you have, like, I was asking Steve Lukather, I've talked to him so many times, like, like, like with you, I said, yeah. do you have stuff? And everyone knows what that means. They have said, oh, I got stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, I got stuff. But see, I'm putting all my gold. Well, we just moved to Moncton since the last time I've talked to you because my parents oh, yeah. Miramichi. Remember, I asked you about Miramichi and you said, Well, I can give you a good New Brunswick story. Yeah. And uh, um, I'm putting all my autographed albums up here. I mean, that's that's what's you know, 38 years of radio, you accrue some stuff. Yeah. Ronald Wilson, right. does he still own and play his fr Framus? What is that? Framus, yeah. Uh, I, I don't have the Ackermans anymore. I do have a Framus. That, that brown one there, that's an AZ-10. Uh, Attila Zoller was the guy that, that's why it's AZ. And they were only in Europe. I think there were probably only about two or three that came to North America. And I bought that guitar in 1976 for $275. And I just got it redone. And uh, if you tried to buy one online right now, they're about 12 grand US because they're rare. So that's the that's the only Framus that I own right there, that AZ-10. But I don't have the Ackermans anymore. One of them I sold when my kids were going to college. And um, uh, the other one I trade, I think I traded it in at one point on something. I don't know. I can't remember. But I had I had two. Of, I think I owned three Ackermans during my my, my career. One of them wasn't very good. Two of them were incredible. One of them was unbelievable. It was my number one guitar. Like the solo that I played at the US Festival was on an Ackerman. And that was a great, great guitar. But I had that refinished. And I sold it probably around 1991. So many people send me clips of the US Festival. They'll always say, after you and I talk, they, yeah. you know, if I ever mention you at all, or after yes. talking to Mike, they'll send me clips of... Love that. We'll have more from Rick Emmett in three, four days. Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. Buy a t-shirt. Help support the channel. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music.